<laughs> well, uh, turns out someone's just started speaking over here through the loudspeaker, so hopefully everyone's hearing us okay. But uh, Mike Ryan here again at Canadian Music Week at the Sheridan Centre Hotel, last day of the conference, and with me is one of the stars of this year's show, Jesper Kidd, a video game uh, fanatics will certainly be familiar with him. Jesper is here, a Dutch video game film composer, um, receiving the Nile Rodgers Global Creators Award. And Jesper is widely considered for with uh, essentially revolutionizing the sound of modern video games for his soundtracks in the Hitman, Assassin's Creed, Borderland, um, a wide array of just absolute block blockbuster uh, video game franchises. So so it's a real honor to have him. And Jesper, thank you for doing this. How are you doing? Good, good. Uh, I'm Danish, by the way. Oh, my apologies. I, 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 I got to represent Denmark. There you go. <laughs> and uh, so I kind of want to start at the beginning. Because, uh, well, first of all, how long has it been since you got involved in video game composing? Because I know you started Ooh, quite young. Yeah, I started my first video game soundtrack uh, I did when I was 17. Wow. So obviously it's been uh, 20, 25 years uh, or something like that. So uh, well, yeah. What the, what was the nature of a video game soundtrack 20 years ago? That's a good question. Um, back then, uh, it, I was working on an Amiga computer, a mm. Commodore Amiga, and um, it was a, you had a, a four sample channels. Mm. That was it. Four channels, <laughs> okay. and uh, you know all you could do on that was sample sounds. So um, there was no, uh, you know, later when music evolved, I started calling it CD-based music because we were able to listen to real music, yeah. you know, and the music that was streaming off a CD that the game was on. Yeah. Um, but back then, uh, you know, I guess that kind of music could be called chip music, you know, and that's what started on the Commodore 64, which mm -hmm. was prior to the Commodore Amiga. And uh, even that kind of music is still alive today, and people are still making that kind of music today. Yeah. So. Was there a real noticeable turning point, or like a, a turning point that you can identify when video game soundtracks became more of a cinematic experience that really immersed you in the game, rather than just kind of some irritating music that was going on in the back of the 8-bit game, know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> I think um, the Commodore 64 was a, was a huge uh, change because that actually had an analog sound chip inside. Yeah. So instead of sounding like beeps, it actually sounded like music. Yeah. It's still, some people would still call it beats, but these beeps suddenly had emotion to them mm -hmm. and they had depth to them. Yeah. Um, but I think when uh, the Sega CD came out and the PlayStation 1 followed it yeah. and games started being streamed off a CD, mm -hmm. you could suddenly put any kind of music you wanted the symphony orchestra music, you could just put that, you know, record that track, put it on the CD, and it would just stream the music mm -hmm. as the game was, was running. And that was a huge moment where suddenly music became a quality that you didn't have to be a total gamer to enjoy the music. Mm -hmm. You know, you could actually reach an audience outside of game yeah. with that music because, the, the, you know, gamers would tend to be more forgiving because they understand the limitations of consoles mm -hmm. and stuff back mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. um, but once that music um, started sounding like really high quality, a lot more people got attracted yeah. to uh, to listening to that kind of music. So that was a big moment for me. Yeah. Right off the bat, the video game producers recognize the importance to the you know, player experience that the music was providing. I think they do. Uh, do you mean in reference to back then, or in yeah? To well, today? it seems obvious that that's the case now. But yeah. back then, was that always the case? Well, back then there was a bit more of. Uh, discovery and mm -hmm. finding out mm -hmm. how things work and technology was moving and changing so fast you know considering you went from Commodore 64 music to Amiga music to mm -hmm. Sega Genesis and and, and and Super Nintendo and then suddenly uh, Sega CD and PlayStation 1 and, and uh, you know Dreamcast and Xbox One I mean it was just it was just so much happening so fast mm -hmm. but once music arrived at the state where it became just purely CD music mm -hmm. um, you know, I think everyone caught up with the idea that, okay, this is now the format. Now let's figure out what we can do with this music. Yeah. Before that, there was a lot of emphasis on technology and having to keep up with all the new consoles that mm -hmm. kept coming out mm -hmm. and how music, you know, like chip music, you had to write music to the chip inside that machine and that they kept putting out new machines. So yeah. you had to keep learning all the stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but so obviously now you don't have to learn how to write for you know, PlayStation 3 versus PlayStation 4, you don't have to think about the difference there. Yeah. You know? So I think that that's the moment, you know, once it became CD-based that we could all, like, take a moment and say, okay, what can we do with this? is yeah. the format now. Now we can settle down a little bit and um, just, just, just figure this out. But mm -hmm. 
there's definitely a lot more emphasis on cinematic now than there was yeah. then. Uh, I think that there was always a, an interest in making a video game feel like a bit of a, a movie in the early days, and that's something that later on evolved into, no, we mean to make it feel like a game. Mm -hmm. Like, what is games? How can we make this an experience that uh, represents what games truly are, which is more like an interactive experience mm -hmm. instead mm -hmm. of just a movie, which is a more linear, sit back and enjoy the ride experience. And, and I think we're figuring out more and more the difference there is huge, you know. The other, again, not to dwell too much on this time period, but the other, um, in the area of like the first PlayStation, first and second PlayStations, and the first Xboxes, and uh, yeah. even Nintendo 64 for that matter. But when you first, when video games first introduced um, essentially a 3D world yeah. rather than you're just going in a straight line across the screen, yes. um, and players were suddenly exploring a world rather than just it being a very linear, linear thing. Yeah. Um, how did that change? the approach to composing for video games? That's a great question and I think it, it for me personally it changed everything because um, it's, it's playing open world games and writing music for open world games is definitely my favorite type of video game to work on uh, because you know th there's of course there's a path through that world that you, you take uh, as you play the game and the game developers would like you to take this path because then it opens up another mission and then you go on a different path and there's a, like a path to get to the end of the game. Um, but once you don't have to take that path and you just present people with a world that they can play around in, mm -hmm. and then, you know, you can take the path and complete the game, sure, or you can go over here and spend uh, two hours over here. Yeah. And, but you also have to, then you have to start thinking, well, of course we have music for the path that we want you to take to complete the game. That's, um, you know, usually the primary focus. Mm -hmm. But we can't lose sight of the fact that we want you to stay in this world and play in this world. Mm -hmm. If it's a city, we want you to be able to walk everywhere. And if you want to spend two hours over in this corner, you should be able to without the music like just stopping and, and without all the atmosphere disappearing because mm -hmm. you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to take the path. No, you can do whatever you want. This is your game. You go play in it. So um, as a composer, you have to think about how do you fill up that world with mood and atmosphere yeah. so that you make people want to stay in that world and also once you've completed that path that the developers have been working so hard to uh, you know to create and the storyline that doesn't mean you can't play the game anymore you can still go back in the world and enjoy and have fun and yeah. find all the nooks and crannies and all the extra stuff and so you have to make sure that there's music for all those um, types of, of gameplay mm -hmm. and um, that type of music is a little bit more about it's a lot more actually about finding the, the mood and the atmosphere of the game when the game is not trying to stress you out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, what does it actually sound like? Where are we? What time period? Um, you know, what are the influences? And then have that music just represent the game in a neutral state. Yeah. When there's not stress or stealth or tension or suspense, but it's or fighting. But the game is still open, but you're doing your own journey. Mm -hmm. And so I try to draw on influences also from the story arc. Like often you have uh, great storylines for games with a lot of lore, mm -hmm. but all that doesn't always get you know, put in the, in the game to play. Yeah. But that doesn't mean it's not part of the world. So I try to pay, put a lot of the lore in that music so you still are reminded about mm -hmm. uh, the game and, and the, the, the background story, even though you might not necessarily be playing that part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As the composer, what are you given to compose to? Like, do they give you the game without the music, essentially, to play around with? Do they give you scenes? Like, how do you know what you're creating to? Sometimes you get the game, sometimes you get videos. It, it really depends. Sometimes you start with screenshots. Sometimes the game is so early that it doesn't even make sense to give you anything. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I've composed entire scores just by looking at storyboards. Mm -hmm. um, but what's, what's the most important is that you, you, you get into the, uh, the mood and the atmosphere of the experience that's being created. Mm -hmm. um, and to take a look at a concept art that the artists themselves in the development studio are using is incredibly uh, inspiring to me because then I know that I'm looking at what the, the, the game studio is looking at. Mm -hmm. And so that way we can all kind of connect with the same material. Yeah. So I love getting concept art. It's a huge help. 
um, it's not always until the end that the game really comes together and shines the way it's supposed yeah. to look. If you're playing a half-broken game, that might that might not give you the inspiration you need. You know. How much of an avid game player are you, and is that necessary to to compose? Well? I am definitely a game player. I'm. I you know I like to think of myself as a hardcore game player, but I guess. That you know, I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm not a professional, and uh, I don't play as much games as I as I used to. Mm -hmm. uh, but I love playing games. I still do it a lot, and it, it, I think it's very important for for me because I like to be thinking as a gamer when I score the music, mm -hmm. so that I see everything from the perspective of the gamer, and I think about what would be great as a gamer for the music to feel like right now. You know, so so it's it's about always trying to do something mm -hmm. that 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 surprises you a bit and, and feels that it's really custom for this project. It feels like music that really only could belong in this game. Yeah. But if you're creating something and it sounds like it could fit any horror movie, then you know, well, you could have gone deeper. Mm -hmm. It could have been, I'm not saying that won't work great for your game, I'm just saying you could have gone deeper. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, I know it's often hard for people to flatter themselves, but I'm wondering, uh, objectively speaking, what have you done within the world of video game composing that has made your work so groundbreaking? Like, is there specific sounds that you introduced into a specific game that was really seen as something new within that world? That's an interesting one. I mean, I have definitely... I was one of the first people to introduce live orchestras and, mm -hmm. and choirs in games. Um, and, you know, I did a lot of experimentation with, um, for example, with choirs, using electronics and choirs and blending them together. and. Um, for for the Hitman franchise, there was there was some really interesting um, orchestral um, performances and sessions we did in Budapest, mm -hmm. where the 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 perspective of the score was from an interior mindset of the lead character in Hitman. Mm -hmm. So the music was scored from for his interior moment as he walked around these um, locations. I mean, it was it was. It, it was obvious we were going to have to score the locations, but to me, when you're in those locations and you open, you, you find a clue that allows you to get an object that allows you to open a door and go somewhere where you're not supposed to go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, instead of having music that sounds like you're in a basement, mm -hmm. it's much more interesting to have some music that you makes create, you... You want to make people nervous. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's not only the nervous, it's also how does Hitman feel at that moment, and maybe he feels exciting. Maybe he feels proud or something. Maybe it's not uh, what you think. Maybe yeah. you can juxtaposition, position, whoops, position that whole thing, and um, that's incredibly interesting yeah. to me because that's something they do in film all the time. Yeah. They do the opposite of what you expect, and uh, I think that's the the game on me that comes out and say we have to keep making this the most interesting experience as we can. How, yeah. when it comes to composing in such a way as to purposely elicit a specific yeah. emotion like that, how much was that something you studied in an analytical way versus how much was kind of just in an innate sense of what works? Well, I mean, it's, I think it's just in intuition by now because mm -hmm. I've played games so much. So I, you know, you, you, there is a certain amount of experimentation that has to go on when you're trying to come up with something different. And um, as long as you're involved with with people that are aware that we might experiment and fail, but when we fail, we always learn, mm -hmm. you know, and then we move forward and we move into a, you know, different direction or we do things a little bit different. Um, then, then that's that's the way forward. So that that's how I see it. I don't yeah. quite see it like that, you know. I just kind of throw myself in there, and um, usually when I'm when I'm hired, people ask me to do do my thing, do my. Let's experiment. Let's mm -hmm. see what happens. Mm -hmm. I've done that so much that I think people are aware that that's a good way to get a lot out of uh, what I bring to the table. Interesting. Mm -hmm. As virtual reality seems more and more to be kind of the new frontier yeah. across a number of fields, but especially in video games, yeah. um, A, is that a realm you've worked in yet, and how do you think that will change yet again the, your approach to composing? I did work in that. Um, I did Robinson the Journey for Crytek. Okay. That was a VR game. Um, and that was a very interesting experience in the sense that the music, it's, it's so intrusive when you are so in that VR world. Mm -hmm. You have to be careful because it's like, oh, there comes the music. You know, you really notice it. Yeah. 
Um, and so we had to make sure to go more subtle with the music and um, the music actually became part of the environment. So you were in this uh, jungle on an alien planet, there's dinosaurs, this planet's going through its uh, Jurassic period. And um, so it became more about how can we make this jungle feel alive and obviously it had to be all acoustic instruments. Um, the, the sounds I made and, and synthesizer performances and stuff all had to, they, they started sounding like they were, you know, sounds from potential animals that could be out there that you weren't seeing or hearing. And the whole thing became very organic that way. And that worked. Yeah. It couldn't just be like, hey, here comes the, here comes the strings or here comes the orchestra to, to enhance the mood. It felt like, why are the strings there? Yeah. This is so realistic. Why, why are they playing some strings? <laughs> um, so that was, that was really uh, mind, kind of mind-bending yeah. to figure that out. Um, there's often a lot of just general comparisons made between film composing and video game composing. Do you see them as completely separate things, or is there a synergy there? And if you do one, is there a higher likelihood you could do the other effectively? Well, as I started doing more and more films lately, uh, the more films I do, the more the difference between films and games become huge. Yeah. And uh, I think by now my definition on that is that video game music and film music is just a huge difference from each other. Yeah. You know, I mean obviously um, uh, if a film composer scores a game, you know, uh, it, you know, he might say, you know, I use the same approach in games that I do in film and there's nothing wrong with that, that's perfectly fine. But I have so much experience writing music for games that I feel that I do not use the same approach when I score a film versus a game. Yeah. You know, when I started scoring films, I had to, I had to start over. I had to learn that whole medium. Everything was from a more, um, you know, everything was from a perspective of the story. Yeah. And the story was always the thing that you were, were close to, and it was like where everything made sense was to support that story and the characters as much as possible. But for video games, you don't have to take the path of the story. There's mm -hmm. all the other things to think about as well. Yeah. Plus, if you get in a, let's say you get in a, in, a, in a fight in a video game and you are fighting away, um, that could last two minutes. Mm -hmm. And then you gotta think about what music am I going to play after that? And how do we make the music so that the fight sounds like you're winning or losing? Mm -hmm. But in a, in a film, it's it's, it's closer to uh, a point of, oh, there could be a car chase, oh, we cut to someone crossing the street, we cut to someone in an apartment cooking dinner. They can cut, cut those three scenes within a 20 second. Yeah. And so you just don't get that long extended amount of time where you really get to express. Um, and it also gives you a little bit more creative freedom mm -hmm. in a sense that you have two minutes to work on, a, for example, a, a battle track. Yeah. Uh, but every second of, of music you write for a film has to um, complement the movie perfectly at mm -hmm. all times. Mm -hmm. you know, but where if you're in a battle in a video game, you can't really know how that battle is going to go, how long it's going to take. So you have to be able to give the composer a bit of freedom there. Yeah. You know? Also in films, you pretty much know exactly how much music you need. Uh, within a, in a game like you know, Battlelands, Assassin's Creed, Stay of Decay, yeah. on average, how much music are you supplying for a game? On average, it's about three hours of music. Okay. Um, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. Um, but that's, you're right, that's a lot more than you usually would do a film. Yeah. You know, some films have uh, 45 minutes of music and mm -hmm. it still feels like there's plenty when you watch yeah. it. Yeah. You know? Perfect. So. Well, Jesper, I'll let you go. I, having made the uh, the trip from Denmark, I'm uh, appreciative that you're able to take a few. I'm actually times. based in Burbank. Oh, are you? Okay. Yeah. Well, not, so not, not, not quite as long. Bad. Not quite as long. <laughs> <laughs> Still a trip, though. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, but Jesper Kidd, um, probably the name in video game composing, and a real honor to speak with. So, Jesper, thank you very much. Awesome, dude. Thanks Cheers. for having me. Thank you. Yeah.